Hi, welcome to Skills Road Women in Trades, boldly building a better future. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the tradition, uh, let me start again. I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Oyora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the land on which I live on, which is the Darwin land. So today's power hour. My name is Charlene, I'm the Skills Road Program Manager and what I do in my role is I do all things work readiness, all right? So I conduct career guidance conversations, um, I do work readiness assessments, as well as role suitability, all right? So today is just a casual chit chat. If you guys know me personally, you know I don't do anything professional. It's a very casual chit chat with some fellow females. Fellow females that are working and thriving in a male dominant environment, all right? So you'll get to hear from five different women with five different experiences in this space, all right? So not only are they here to promote and raise awareness about women in trades, but also giving you tips and tricks on how to succeed, all right? So today's webinar, we're gonna give you the unedited, uncensored, and a version of where you can ask all of those burning questions and fueling that fire within to make sure that you get to where you wanna be, all right? So um, that doesn't end there. What we do is we also have um, some polls going, uh, we will be going throughout the whole uh, power hour. So if you jump on slido.com using our hashtag power hour, um, you can ask questions through this power hour. You can engage in our live polls. Um, for those that do engage in our live polls and ask one of the best questions, you go in the draw to win one in three $50 Bunnings gift vouchers. All right, so I do wanna see some juicy, awkward questions that I would love to ask on camera. All right, so today's guest today, we have Lauren, who is currently a fully qualified Fridgie, Louise as a party, mentor and coaching uh, for tradeswomen, and she's also um, nominated for 2023 Seven News Young Achiever Award. We have Bree Hudson from Clean Energy Council, Lauren Fay, representative of Narwick, and Talita from Apprenticeship Support Australia to discuss all things support in our apprenticeship space. All right, so first things first, let's start off with our first poll. All right, so what do you think the biggest barrier preventing women from entering non-traditional trades? Do you think it's A, lack of access to training and education? B, gender bias and discrimination in the workplace? C, stereotypes and cultural expectations? Or D, lack of interest or awareness in the non-traditional trades? So my role is actually to raise those awarenesses. So hopefully it's not the lack of interest or awareness. Holy monkey, that was not the one that I was expecting. Um, so currently really far in the lead, we've got the gender bias and discrimination in the workplace. So I was really hoping that, you know, that wasn't gonna be the top one, but it obviously is. And it's still very, very um, apparent and very current. So that's pretty annoying. And let's change that, shall we, with this, um, you know, this power hour and what we're trying to achieve with this whole entire thing. Um, so my first speaker, we have Lauren. Um, Lauren, are you there? She's joining us via Zoom. Hi. Hi. How are you going? How are you? Good, how are you? good. Um, so you're a current qualified Fridgie. Tell me a bit about, about you and how you entered into that space. Perfect. So my name is Lauren Campbell and I'm currently employed as a refrigeration air conditioning technician. I've been in industry for just over six years and I started my apprenticeship, my four year apprenticeship straight out of high school. My current role as a service technician includes servicing and maintaining HVAC and R equipment in large scale buildings around the Brisbane city area, along with a few university campuses. HVAC and R being short for heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration. I'm also called upon for, to attend breakdowns. These occur when a piece of equipment may be faulty or if a heating or cooling complaint comes in. I am required to attend site and fault find the issue for the customer to ensure the system is working as it should be. That sounds amazing and so intricate. Um, in terms of that poll just that uh, just got answered, gender bias being you know the number one thing that's holding women back, have you experienced any of that? And do you have any stories that you could share? Yeah, definitely. Like I do believe in the society that we're in and the gender bias that's happening at the moment. There is a big push to get us females in the workforce. Um, I personally haven't really experienced a lot of gender discrimination, but there is definitely niggles here and there that you just get looked upon a little bit differently. Uh, but that's when we just have to step up and strive past it. 
perfect. Um, that pretty much sums it up. You just got to kind of like, you know, go to the right people that, you know, can actually change um, what Yeah, definitely. Happen. And yes, yeah, ke keeping with your mentors as well. I've got a very great mentor within my company um, and he's always on the backbone of us emails getting to the workforce. So I think it's finding that right company and finding that mentor as well that you can always rely back on. Thank you for planting that little seed because we get to introduce you to some <laughs> wonderful mentors as well. Um, so let's go back to little Lauren. Let's uh, find out why baby Lauren wanted to enter into the tradie space. So back to baby Lauren. Baby Lauren loved going camping, loved going outdoors with her dad, always setting up, going beaches, um, dams, all that kind of stuff. So when I got into high school, I went to an all-girls female Catholic school. So it was very pushed upon, we're going to go to university. I wasn't anything against university, but it was more so the fact that I didn't want to jump into something that I had no idea about. Like I didn't want to pay 40, 50 grand to go to university to do a business degree or a nursing degree when I didn't know for sure that's what I wanted to do. Um, in, the, my, in my last year of high school, my dad was like, look, go do some work experience in the trades. You love being hands-on. You love being outdoors, talking to people. So I was like, okay. Um, did some work experience with the company I'm at now. I absolutely loved it. And then the rest was kind of history. I kind of started my four-year apprenticeship and I've now just come out of two years out of that. So six years into the industry. I love that it was actually your dad that pushed you to do that work experience because for me personally, when I do I go out to those schools and I do chat to a lot of parents, we I have get a lot of parents that is actually one of my barriers in getting you know young females into the trade space. So I love that that was your parent actually pushing you towards that. And yeah, no, um, there's, there was always. Sorry, no, go for it. Um, I was just going to say, there's always apprehensives. I've spoken to a lot of um, student parents as well, and there's always apprehensives about oh, how is my daughter going to be treated? How is this going to happen? What's going to happen with their... And I think it's just getting that awareness out, just like these um, webinars that we're having today, getting that awareness out that there is people out there in the back of your corner wanting to push you forward. Um, you just need to find the right space. Absolutely. And funny stat, one in three university graduates actually don't enter into the degree, the degree that they've studied in. So, you know, you've got a house deposit sitting there in hex debt. Let's figure out what you want exactly want to do before you, you know, enter into it. So, and that's exactly what you've done um, with that, Lauren. So I really appreciate taking the time out to chat with us today. Um, you know, I know it's very busy out there in the tradie space. So thank you so yes. much for taking that time. Perfect. Thank you, Charlene. Thanks. All right, so let's head back to our nifty little polls on slido.com, hashtag power hour. Our next lovely poll is going to be, what challenges do you think women face in non-traditional trades? A, physical demands and safety concerns. B, gender bias and discrimination. C, lack of access to training and education. Or D, all of the above. Now I do see some anonymous questions coming through, so I will keep those in my back pocket for um, our Q and A session at the back, um, at the back end of this, at the moment. But um, as our poll results are showing, all of the above is gender bias and discrimination is pretty much even with all of the above, which is very interesting. Physical demands and safety concerns is pretty close behind, um, which. Yeah, makes sense, but you obviously, you don't need a gym membership if you're working front day physically. So just saying you'll save some money there. I know I've spoken to a lot of female brickies that, um, you know, say that they just got rid of their gym membership because they don't need it. They work out at work. Um, so I would love to introduce um, my next guest. Um, she is known, award-winning known. So her name's Louise Azapati. She is a mentor and coach for trades women and she is currently nominated for the 2023 Seven News Young Achiever Award. Louise, welcome to this lovely webinar. Oh, just talk to me because I love listening to your story. Yeah, so I'll start at the beginning. So when I was in year seven, I tried to leave school. It was not for me. It was not my jam at all. So I grew up on a farm and we were picking, packing vegetables and as well as fixing farm machinery. So I worked out that that's what I really loved to do. So I decided in year nine that I would become a mechanic. When I was in year 10, I did work experience in all of my school holidays. And I started off doing work experience at my local bike shop where we used to go and get parts. They knew us there. They did work experience there. They didn't have an apprenticeship for me. I kept doing work experience, continuing at different workshops. I did work experience, one of my most memorable ones, uh, I did work experience at a lawnmower workshop, which then turned into a Saturday job while I was in year 10, um, which is something I recommend. 
while you're in like high school if you know that trades what you want to do is to get like a weekend position um and funny enough they were like oh louise like just get us to check your bolts once so you've done just because we're not sure if you're strong enough yet so i put in all my effort into making sure all the bolts were tight and then i started snapping bolts and i'm like <laughs> louise Louise, you're good now. You're strong enough. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> we ticked that off. Um, a bit after that, I ended up going to Brett Carter ex- um, Apprenticeship Expo, which was in Sydney, and I met Sarah there. So Sarah, at the time, was a first-year heavy vehicle mechanic. She was the same height as me, the same build as me. At the time, we were both blonde. Um, but she encouraged me to do work experience at her work. So I did that. I loved it. I applied for the job, and I got the job. So. Love that. And you're not too strong for those bolts, I believe. No, no, they're quite a bit bigger on heavy vehicles. <laughs> so it's got that. I love that. So we did just hear Lauren talking about mentors and you're a mentor and coach for tradeswomen. Um, who was your mentor and what made you want to become a mentor for others? So one of the things, so my mentor at the time was my apprentice master. So at the time at Cummins where I worked, we had an apprentice mentor who was formerly in that role um, and he kind of guided me through any issues that I was having. The one thing that he couldn't really help support me through was being a woman in a male dominant space. Um, So like I said, I had Sarah there. She was one year ahead of me. So we were both kind of still making it through together. And I didn't end up meeting any qualified tradies or mechanics until I was a third year apprentice. So I didn't really have anyone to look up to on where I was Just winging it. Just Just winging it. Um, Looking up to some of the boys and looking back on it, they probably weren't the best mentors. (laughs) (laughs) But some of them really cared and really gave um, me a shot. Like a lot of the older guys talked, like treated me like I was their granddaughter and really took me under their wing. It was so sweet um, having that relationship. But there was a bit of a roller coaster where some of the mentors that I did decide to look up to weren't actually the best people to... Um, follow along with as uh, a 15 year old girl (laughs) look different life places I completely understand Um, so for those logged on I believe it'd be all uh, hopefully job seekers and those wanting to enter into that space Um, what steps do you think they can be doing right now to just get themselves ahead of the game yeah so pretty much if you want to enter into a trade really getting that hands-on experience as soon as you can and it can be in any trade Um, That kind of first year of our apprenticeship is really like workshop awareness, site awareness, tool awareness, which can really convert over. So like I did, I did work experience in all of my school holidays just because year 12, year 11 and 12 was not an option for me. So I was like, this is a step that I need to take. And trust me, guys, it works. I had like three or four job opportunities lined up at the end of year 10. Which one do I get to pick? (laughs) I love that. And there's heaps of amazing opportunities. You can do a pre-apprenticeship course. Um, which gives you some of those units to first start up on. You can do the work experience, you can get a part-time job, you can look at going into a trade school where you can do year 11 and 12 as well as complete like the first year of your apprenticeship. But really getting that awareness through a part-time job, even um, something you can do is go to a lawnmower workshop because a lot of those machines get thrown out. So you can pick up one of those machines and just pull it apart. It doesn't need to go back together, but it gets you using your hands and being familiar with how to use tools. Oh, I love that. Now, I want to ask you a burning question that I want to know. What are some myths about females entering into a non-traditional trade that you can completely bust right now and say that is so not true? The not strong enough thing. That is, it really like kind of gets to me. We are really striving for diversity in anything. And one of the things like we all have a different body shape. Women like they can be weak and strong women, they can be weak and weak and strong men. Um, we all got different sizes and different body shapes. So I like to use the example that in my apprenticeship, I worked with a lot of guys that were bodybuilders. So they literally look like walking clouds. Um, but they would ask me for help as much as I would ask them for help. Because spaces are tight, you need little hands for different things, you need to get into all these crevices. And as much as I needed them to lift something big and heavy in an awkward position, they would need me to get into a tight spot or put my hand in a spot. So usually we'd have a trade-off, be like, hey, I got this thing I need to lift, and they'll be like, oh, I got this space I need to go into. And we literally used to just swap jobs. So it's just diversity is really important. There's none of this not strong enough. You build your strength. There was a lot of times when I was actually stronger than some of the boys, um, just because I knew how to use my body in different positions. 
I love that. That's yeah. hilarious to think they're clouds. Sorry, I still have that <laughs> image in my head. Um, so with your business, uh, Louise, as a part of your mentoring and coaching and everything like that, you have reached all the highs of highs in this space. What's in the future for you? Yeah, so really just getting the tools to navigate the situations that we might come in as tradeswomen to as many tradeswomen as possible. So I've got a Facebook community and I share a lot of these tips on social media. But really, like, what do you do if you come across sexism? Because I'm not going to sit here and say it's going to be all sunshine and rainbows. Like, the sunshine and rainbows are really, really good and they're usually most of the time, but you might get some situations where people might not be happy that you're there. I've had a few, um, I had this old Russian guy actually look me dead in the eye and tell me that I didn't belong there. So what do you do in those situations? They come up really quickly and it's kind of remembering that you do belong there. Remembering that, you know what, this guy has his own opinions from his own culture and they're not on you. And really just giving those tools to tradeswomen so then they can, if they do meet up with any of my version of the old Russian guy that doesn't want you to be there, what do you do? How do you work through that? That's amazing. And so um, Louise will be sticking around um, for our Q&A session afterwards. So please feel free to shoot through any questions for her, as well as an email is going to be sent with all of our guest speakers' contact details. So please make sure that you guys have registered um, through the link and uh, we'll give you a, uh, we'll send you out a link to all of their contact details and to Louise's Facebook page. Um, and all of that will be in there, as well as a link to this recording. Again, this is being recorded. So you won't be able to win if you're watching this later. All right, so on to our lovely next Slido poll. All right, how important is it to have more women represented in non-traditional trades? A, extremely important. B, somewhat important. C, not very important. D, not at all. Not at all. Ooh, rough. We just spoke about, you know, Louise getting into those tight spaces. So, so yeah, I believe it would be extremely important. All right, so somewhat important does have a few votes. What's about them, men? No, I'm joking. I'm just being a feminist. I'm pretend I'm not. <laughs> All right, so extremely important at 82% of our audience is um, has voted, and honestly, I do believe that is very accurate. The diversity that Louise just spoke about, and what we can bring to the table. So, um, you know, if you are thinking of entering into that space, please jump on skillsroad.com.au. Um, we do have a job fit test that you can assess your work readiness as well as your role suitability. So you can select up to 10 different careers in that job fit test and um, it's going to help define what you're more suitable for as well as, um, you know, give you tips and tricks on how to better your work readiness score. All right. So our lovely guest speakers today, they are all coming in on Zoom. We have Laura, Lauren from Narwick, we have Bree from Clean Energy Council and we have Georgina from Downer. Welcome ladies. Hi Charlene, thanks for having us. Hi, so Bree, I'll jump over to you. Um, talk to me about your role at Clean Energy Council. Absolutely, um, thanks Charlene and thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Bree, I work for the Clean Energy Council. For those that don't know who we are, we're the peak body for renewable energy companies right across Australia. So that's small scale rooftop solar, large scale wind, hydro, you name it, we've got it. Um, so part of my job in the workforce development team is making sure that we have the strong and skilled workforce we need to make the energy transition happen. And obviously a big part of that is making sure that that workforce is diverse and inclusive. So right now we're at 30% of representation of women in the clean energy sector in Australia, that's pretty good, but it could be better. So that's what we're working towards. Love that. Thank you so much. Lauren from Narwick, do you want to give us a bit of a rundown about you and the wonderful association that is Narwick? <laughs> Thanks, Charlene, of course. Um, I'm Lauren. I'm the general manager here at Narwick. I've been working with Narwick for around four years. Um, so what is NAWIC or who is NAWIC? Uh, NAWIC is the National Association of Women in Construction. And so we're here to support all women from apprentices all the way through uh, to CEOs and chairs of board members uh, that work in construction. So we do a number of things. Uh, we host events, we do education seminars, uh, we're out in schools, we talk to people. Um, and so NAWIC is, is seen as somewhere where women and men can come together and um, meet new people within the industry. 
NAWIC has a really ambitious goal of getting more women into construction. Similar to Bray, we have targets that we've set for the industry, and that is to get 25% of women into construction by 2025. Currently, we're only at 13.6% in Australia, and trades is, um, it's gone up slightly. We're at 3% now in trades, which is really, really exciting that it's jumped in the last year, um, but it's very low. And so that's what we're here to do is to educate and lobby for more women in construction. What a massive target. And I, I'm sure you guys are going to achieve it because I know the wonderful things you guys are doing in that space. Um, and again, we will be posting the links out to you guys via email uh, for clean energy as well as Narwick, as well as Downer. So I want to introduce Georgina from Downer. Please uh, introduce yourself and your role. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Georgina and I'm the apprentice business partner here at Downer. And I've been in my role for the last five years, um, but also worked in the apprentice space in England as well before I moved over to Australia. Um, for nicer weather, but it is raining here in Melbourne today. So <laughs> I've been uh, jibbed out of some sunshine. Um, but yeah, I've been working at Downer for the last five years and my main role is to help the business and the managers understand the apprenticeship system and their responsibilities so that they know what they're committing to, but also helping the apprentices throughout their journey from start to finish. So my main aim is to get them through to that successful completion and hopefully employed with us going forward um, in their qualified positions as well. Um, at Downer, we're a leading provider of how we describe integrated services um, across Australia and New Zealand. So we do various different trades and industries from electrical, refrigeration, plumbing, um, civil construction, um, also some of the other different trades like cookery um, and cleaning and business traineeships as well. We do quite a broad range of, of work and we do it for a very broad range of sectors as well. So we do things like asset maintenance, the rail industry, roads, um, the utilities business, um, government, as well as health and education. Um, we're a very large business, so we have 33,000 employees across approximately 300 different sites and projects. And at the moment, we have 424 apprentices that are active um, at this time, and around 90% of them are female. So nice to see that there is, but again, there's still more work to do in that space as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Georgina. Um, my first question is over to you, Bree. Um, what uh, programs or resources are available at Clean Energy Council that some of our um, loginies listeners listeners um, can learn and know about at the Clean Energy Council? Yeah, sure. So we've got lots of resources. Um, the ones that I think would be particularly relevant to your audience, since 2015, we've run the Women in Renewables program that um, I'm coordinating. So that through that, we offer scholarships um, and programs for students who are studying. But something that I really think could be useful for everyone joining today, we do profiles of women that are actually in the industry and working in the industry. So we've profiled a bunch of women across the country that are working, whether it's rooftop solar or blade technicians on wind farms, and actually like how they got into the industry, how they find working in that industry as a woman, um, and tips and just sharing insights on what their jobs like day to day. So that could be really useful. And I think that's going to be sent around after this session. So keep an eye out for that. Um, more than half of the clean energy workforce is in electrical and mechanical trades, as well as engineering type roles. So it's a huge majority of the workforce. So there's and 20 percent of that, I should say, is electricians and other electrical trades. So there's a huge opportunity. So another helpful resource would be our clean energy careers guide. It kind of spells out different roles, um, really important roles in the sector, what training you need, licenses. And we also point out tips for where to study and what to look out for to make sure that you have those skills when you finish to jump into the clean energy sector. Um, so I think those are the main ones. But yeah, you can jump into our website and there's lots of interesting stuff on there. That's going to be so helpful for a lot of our audience, um, especially with those character backgrounds. Um, you know, we just heard from uh, Lauren Campbell, the Fridgy, but, you know, to get all the array of different um, trades that you guys might have access to, that would be wonderful. Um, so, Lauren, over to you. Now we um, have a lovely website with all resources. Do you want to break it down and uh, tell the audience what um, the best ones to kind of pull out from and what they can look for in, at the website? Yeah, sure. So um, 
similar to Bree, we have uh, listed a number of career profiles. Um, and so we, we have put them in two different categories. One's a trades and then others are non-trade roles within construction. Now they go through um, and they profile females in the industry. So you'll notice that even their photos are real women doing real work on site. So it's, it's, it's really great for you to see what you can be because at the moment, a lot of the times you can't see yourself in those roles. These can to do that. Um, and so, uh, so we've got that on the, on the website. We've got a number of different things as well that could help um, employers. And even though you're, you're not employees yet, but that will help as well. So there's a, a bunch of things on there that you can look at. Um, we also ref reference a book um, that was created by the MBA, which is Master Builders Australia. And they've created a, a wonderful job seeker handbook that is also on the web on the website. So you can have a look at that as well. But that takes you through all the different roles, um, your wages, what your expected salary would be once you're past the apprenticeship stage, where to study, what you need. And if you actually, what you might, you know, if you're currently, if you like art or if you like working with your hands and working with, you know, tools, it tells you what kind of skills um, that, that you, you might like this trade if you have these qualities. So it will, it will give you a little bit more um, of an outline of, yeah, that, that's me. I do like doing that. So maybe I, I could look into being a brickie, for example. So, yeah. I love that. Thank you, Lauren. And um, Apprenticeship Support Australia are a member for NARWIC. So if you do take up an apprenticeship um, with Apprenticeship Support Australia, you do get access to, you know, a lot more resources available on NARWIC as well, being, you know, apprenticeship under ASA. Um, so I will uh, chat to Georgina, being on the employer side of things. What can you tell our audience from an employer management perspective? What can they do now and tips and tricks to kind of stand out from the candidate pool? What have you learned from that side? And um, what can you tell our audience what to do? Pretty much. Yeah. No worries. Well, the way I see it is as an apprentice, wow. your main role when you're within a business is to learn. You're, you're there to learn and absorb lots of information, not just learn your trade, but obviously learn the business, um, different management styles. You know, you're going to encounter different people and learning to adapt with that as well. So that for me is the main, um, the main kind of job description. So when we are looking at candidates, obviously with that kind of non bias view. Um, the main thing we're looking for is easy and confident communication or conversation. We want to get to know you as a person, um, you know, as an apprentice, especially first years, you may not have the technical knowledge or technical smarts as of yet, and that's totally fine. Um, what we're not expecting you to come in and have massive amounts of knowledge or know all the correct answers to the questions. Um, but what we're looking for and what's very key is that you kind of give your personality across as best as you can through your nerves um, and, and try and communicate as clearly as you can. Um, and I think Rihanna said once in a video, you know, fake it till you make it. If you, if you feel like you're not particularly feeling that confident that day, um, try and channel your inner Rihanna to try and project that in the interview. Because we really just want to get to know who you are and what your interests are. Um, obviously, there's things you can do to prepare which help with that. Um, you can do kind of a mock interview or discuss with a comfortable adult or a peer what you're going to say to certain interview questions. Um, you don't necessarily have to sit down and mock it out and pretend that you're in that interview se uh, session, but it does help to either have a conversation with it um, or practicing having a conversation with a stranger, like if you're getting your morning coffee, talking to the barista or the person serving you a bit more about their day just helps build that confidence when it comes to communicating. Um, another thing to prepare for is learning to smile as well in the interview because you're quite naturally very nervous. Um, but yeah, learning to smile in those situations, again, just hopefully helps you feel more relaxed. Um, and being prepared to say that you don't know uh, you don't know the answer or you don't know what um, what something means because you're, you're not expected to know everything. Um, but yeah, there's obviously certain things you can do. There's a bit of homework you can do about A, a company you're going for, 
you can try and prepare questions to ask as well. Um, things like, you know, could me could you take me through um, the day of an apprentice in your business? What what kind of would they be doing day to day, and how? How, what does the long term look like after the apprenticeship? So it shows that you're looking at those long term goals. Um, but again, you can look into the qualification, you can research into kind of what you'll be learning. And if there's some technical or industry terms you're not sure on, um, you can take some time to be familiar with them, but you're by no means expected to know everything. Um, but the main things we look for, and, and again, this is really, it's for candidates across different genders and different backgrounds, is an open-minded approach. Somebody who is excited to learn, because like I say, that's gonna be your main role, is learning. So somebody who's got a really good attitude towards their apprenticeship. Um, even, you know, it'll go through peaks and troughs, but during those times where you think, you know, you might be disengaging or not engaging with it, it's really important to get your employer involved and have those communications with them. Um, and being curious, you know, asking things at the interviews, um, we're such a large business, we kind of have our own language. And I even get it in meetings where people will say short terms for things, and I have no idea what it means. And I have to put my hand up and say, what does that mean? So don't be afraid to do that either. Um, I think that's most of my notes. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Georgina. And <clears throat> I do a lot of work readiness workshops at schools. And the one thing that I always love telling my students is that your manners is free, so use them. So pleases and thank yous. The person that's interviewing you may have had a crap day and you just saying thank you to them could just, you could just stand out just that little bit more. So, you know, we know the user pretty rude, no, I'm joking. Um, just remembering to use your manners is just something that you could just stand out. Everyone else might not have thanked them for their time, but you could just be that one. So be that point of difference there. Um, thank you so much for that. Now, um, should I go to a poll? Yeah, <laughs> sorry guys, hang on. All right, um, thank you. Oh yeah, go, go back, sorry, my bad. Mind blank. blank. Um, so did you guys have anything else to add before um, you guys are sticking around for our Q&A session at the end uh, where because I've got some questions floating around down here. So if you guys have anything burning to say now or you're happy to wait till Q&A. I'm going to say stunned silence. Yeah, happy to wait. Yeah. <laughs> have to wait. Thank you for being on the same page as me. Woo. All right. So our next Slido question, everyone. Which industry do you think needs more gender diversity in non-traditional trades? A, construction and manufacturing, B, transport and logistics, C, information technology and cybersecurity, D, energy and utilities. All right. Oh yes, so making sure that we are logging onto slido.com using that hashtag power hour to be able to engage with our polls. Um, a, B, C, or D. The funnier questions will be most likely to be picked for the prizes. One of three $50 Bunnings gift vouchers. All right, so we've got construction and manufacturing in the lead at 67%. We did have energy and utilities second, but transport and logistics have taken over at 22%. IT and cybersecurity, come on. Nothing, we got nothing for IT. You know, banks would be against that, just saying. Um, but yes, we definitely need more women in construction and manufacturing. So I do agree with that 68% transport logistics. Perfect. So time to introduce my final guest, um, the wonderful Talita. She is um, a staff member here at Apprenticeship Support Australia, and she's going to share all things, the support that you guys can access once entering into this space. So Talita, welcome to my fun little webinar. Thank you. Tell me about you. Okay, so um, my name is Talita Schwab. I've worked in apprenticeship centres um, and supporting job seekers for um, over 20 years. 
So um, I've seen lots of different things changing and my most exciting thing that's changing is that I'm seeing more um, female apprentices, which is amazing, and more female um, construction and trades employers. So um, I've spent a lot of my career actually supporting apprentices and trainees in removing those barriers to them completing because that's really what we want. Um, and we see the support as a, it's, a, it's a team effort. We collaborate with you and your goals and how do we help you get to where you wanna go. Perfect, so um, our audience today will be job seekers and just thinking of it and just planting that little seed. How can we add water and sun and let this little flower grow? What can they be accessing right now to help guide them in the right direction? Absolutely, so we have a specific women in non-traditional trades team. Um, part of that team is a women in non-traditional trades specialist, Natalie Broly. So um, she is sunning herself in Bali at the moment, otherwise I'm sure she would have loved to have been here. Um, but she is amazing in supporting you from the beginning of your journey, even if you just sort of, you've got a seed of a thought I might want to do this I'm not sure where I want to work in the trade so she can help you from that part right until um, the very end and it's from things such as resumes cover letters interview skills and interview preparation such as Georgina was saying um, we can definitely help with that um, and also looking at the job fit test and career quiz to go, okay, what do you like to do and which trade's sort of going to suit you best? Um, and then throughout your apprenticeship from the beginning right until the very end and then looking at career, um, yeah, career wants and needs once you've completed. And if there's any sort of um, big uh, barriers that come up along the way, we've got a specialist team to um, help support Natalie, support you as well. And there's no such thing as a silly question. So Natalie is there for you um, all the time. I love that, thank you so much. And yes, support this because, mm -hmm. you know, we the whole theme I feel like today has just been making sure that we have a mentor and someone that you can go to to ask those silly questions so then you don't go back to your employer and look silly. So it's just that kind of soft landing so you can fly, if that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, Nat Broly, she is amazing and wonderful, um, completed an apprenticeship herself. So she knows pretty much the ins and outs of it all. So she's definitely someone to definitely get a call to and show her details will be in the email as well. Um, so in terms of your other role, the in-training support, mm -hmm. um, and you do a lot of the females currently in a trade at Apprenticeship Support Australia, yeah. are there any things that are flagged as a common issue um, that you're being raised with? Yeah. Um, the biggest things are um, the women are worried about how they're going to fit in at TAFE, you know, are they going to be the only female in their class, um, and then also addressing health and safety issues um, on site, especially if they're not necessarily in a static work workplace, if they're moving around to job sites, um, so, you know, toilet facilities, um, extra help if they're sort of at the beginning of their apprenticeship, you know, working on their strength, those sort of things. So we're supporting them through having those conversations with employers and how to address those and how to support themselves um, and get support from their employers with that TAFE space as well and the culture space. So with that service, do you only speak to the apprentice themselves or are you able to engage with the employer as well just so they know who you're allowed to speak yeah. to? So um, it's really up to the apprentice. So if um, the apprentice says, no, I'd prefer you to just sort of keep this conversation confidential, we absolutely do. Um, but part of our role is we look at all of the people that are able to support and assist um, women in completing their non-traditional trade apprenticeship. And the employers and other work um, colleagues have a really big part of that as well. So it's, um, it's not just women in isolation. It's not just apprentices, you know, doing all of the hard yards themselves it's all really a collaborative collective effort um, so yeah we support uh, our pre employers as well for that. It was like you were in my brain because that absolutely leads into my next question <laughs> of collaboration. Yeah. How can men support women in trades? How can we foster and develop that relationship and make that grow that situation? I actually think that it's so important. I had somebody ask me this the other day they said oh you know I'm, I'm a male but am I really going to be able to help with this? I said, absolutely, they're, you know, they're part of the solution. One, because there's a higher percentage of men um, in 
those trade roles. So they've got that experience of the on the job training, but also it's about calling out maybe some unconscious bias um, or some behavior that might not be appropriate within the workplace. Um, and it's something that you see in so many different areas, unfortunately, not just in trades, um, but it's about us all working together. So it needs to be um, men and women working together to, um, yeah, to help our young ladies finish. Absolutely. No, I absolutely love everything about what you just said because a lot of men feel like, oh, I shouldn't be advocating for this because I'm the, I'm the issue. Whereas, well, yeah. that's how you break it. Absolutely. And, and if it's just the if it's just the voice of women, then it come it can come across to some people. It's like, oh, well, look, you know, whatever. You don't know what you're talking about. Where if we've got the voice of the men in there as well, it's yeah. All stronger. right. Can you tell me? a time where a female apprentice has called you and go, I've got a stupid question for you. Mm -hmm. Tell me what the question is, because I want to know. <laughs> Look, my, <laughs> my tagline is there is no such thing as a stupid question. <laughs> so I can't think of any particular stupid questions, but um, I think, um, I think the, the biggest question or the most common question I've had is, you know, um, is this okay? Do I have the right to be able to say this? How do I have this conversation? Um, is this something that you can help me change? Um, yeah. Do I have the right to ask this question? Yes. That is wild to me because yeah. not only are you an employee, like you're allowed to ask whatever you want. Yeah, like, I you know, know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and that, yes, yeah, she may think that's a stupid question, but also valid at the same time. It's yeah. wild. So yeah. thank you so much for that insight, yeah. Talita. She will be sticking around again for our Q&A session if you had any questions directly for her in that apprenticeship space. Now we've got our final Slido question. Going on to Slido. Are oh, we doing Q&A first? Yeah. Oh, my bad, sorry. <laughs> I obviously really listened at our um, practice run, hey, guys. <laughs> if you know me, you know I didn't listen. So, Q&As, am I looking at this thing? All right, now let's get our lovely friends online as well. How swift was our little move? All right, so the moderator has turned off quick Q and A's on my end. Is it an online presentation? If there's no yeah. So do I just go on the right? Is this me over here? All right. So do we have our team online as well? All right, so my first question, I might throw this one over to Lauren at Narwick. What would you recommend for those who don't have a great mentor and need to rely on themselves to break barriers in the workplace? Great question. Um, so I think it's really important that you have someone there to support you. Um, if you don't have anyone, please contact us um, because I will find someone for you, whether it's in the same state as you or somewhere else, we will find someone um, to support you. But if you can't get that type of person, I would suggest talking to anybody outside. So someone in your family, you can also access mental health support as well, depending on what the situation is um, and depending on what type of things are happening. We get women coming to us all the time um, and men, which is great. Um, men concerned about their um, female either partners or colleagues um, that something has happened to them. Um, and we support them with giving them um, either a mentor to go to directly um, and then the resources. So there's different resources. So safe work in wherever you or work safe, depending on where you're located. Um, there's 1-800 respect. There's a bunch of numbers around sexual harassment claims if that's what you're facing. So there's a number of resources out there to to get you safe and support you if you can't find a mentor. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy for anybody to reach out and we'll support you um, in getting you to whatever help you need. I love that. Thank you. And again, um, Narwick details will be posted in that email as well. So thank you, Sam, for uh, posting that amazing um, question for us. Uh, the next one, I might throw this one over to Georgina. How important is it for girls to get their license in the trade world? I want to get it. Oh, it just disappeared. Hang on. I want to get it before leaving school so the men don't have to drive me around alone. So this is the driver's license? Yes. Yeah. 
Um, when I used to work at um, an apprenticeship centre and was helping businesses recruit for their trades, um, it was quite a common theme that, you know, many of the small business owners would want a licence because um, that just, as a small business owner, you know, they'd have maybe a couple of trucks um, and, and they would want to be able to basically progress you to have, um, you know, your own truck and basically get around by yourself. So it is quite an important thing, I think. Um, it's not necessarily required in some time, in some instances with some businesses. Um, like I say, with Downer, we're quite a large business. We usually don't do loan working. People usually work in pairs um, and have somebody who will do most of the driving. But obviously, there is lots of safety concerns as well when one person does the driving. So it is something I would recommend just so that you can add it to your resume, add it to your application forms. Um, and the sooner you can get it done, it's not just obviously for, for roles, but it's nice to have your own bit of independence as well in your personal life and be able to get out and about um, and do the things you want to do as well. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, pretty much independence. You get freedom as well. Um, this one's hilarious, but like also I'm going to show it to Louise. It's, it's anonymous though. I really want to know who wrote it. Sorry if this is a mean question, but can I wear makeup and have acrylic nails being a tradie? Yes. So um, all that kind of stuff is up to you. Like if you feel comfortable working with nails, like I actually, so I just have mine painted all the time, purely so you can't see that they're dirty underneath. Um, but I, one of the girls that I come across, more than one, but one in particular, she actually used her acrylic nails like as a flat blade screwdriver sometimes. And it gives you a little bit of extra extension into the tight spaces. So it's all about that diversity and the length of your nails is part of diversity. As for the makeup, it's up to what you want to do. Me personally, if I have mascara on and I sweat, my eyes swell up, so it's not really a safe thing for me. But if you want to have the lashes, if you want to have the makeup on, go for your life. It's up to you. Sam's getting an award, I swear to God. How can women professionally and appropriately tell a man to F off and let them let you do your job? That that's a win for me. I'm taking one of those. Sam, um, email us. <laughs> we'll get your details off you, but that's hilarious. Just do it. Um, no, don't actually go to your manager. Sorry, don't listen to me. Um, this one, the next question um, I wanted to ask and it disappeared on me. Do you want me to say something about the... Oh yeah, please do. That's your, that's your yeah. jam. So usually there's like, you can kind of, if you feel like you need to say that a lot, you can come up with like a different line that you can use that can um, implement that. I actually had a client who was, um, the her co-workers were actually hitting her on the ass with paperwork kind of stuff, like as they went past. And her thing was like, no touching, like, and that was her like first level. And then she was going to go like more serious up to HR and kind of thing. But that was enough to be like, no, this is not right. Yeah. Um, you can also be, especially if someone's taking over a lot, because that's something that can happen when you're lifting something heavy. A guy can come, no, 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 I'm going to lift that for you. I'll do that for you. And be like, no, I can do it. Like even just saying like, no, you can do it. Hey, I don't think that's appropriate. Can you please not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah that, and that ties into my next question from Anonymous again. Um, I would love to work in a trade industry, but I don't want to be treated like a baby or like one of the boys. How do I set this boundary? Have you had to have these discussions with our current apprentices? Um, I haven't had to have it with any of our current apprentices, but I think it's, um, it is part of being confident and, um, yeah, and being able to have that conversation. Okay, here is what I find happening. And just saying to them, look, that if they're joking or any sort of behaviour that you feel uncomfortable with, please don't do that. And or finding you know a, a kind of a, a funny but serious way like Louise suggested of doing that, um, and yeah, it's it's all about communication, and getting that support, so, but standing your ground. No, I don't think that's funny. And then if it continues, then you escalate that further. And if you need any help, that's what our mentors are there um, for to support you on how to have those conversations and practice those conversations as well. Safely. Yeah. As a mentor yourself, did you have mm. any guidance? And I'm probably going to ask the rest of the ladies because this is. Mm pretty important to set those boundaries pretty early on so yeah. so with the jokes in particular that are like either sexist or racist or that kind of thing one of my favorite questions for the girls or the people to ask um, the person who's saying the, the joke um, is can you please explain to me how that's funny it really gets them to think themselves because a lot of times when you're telling someone something they like blank off and don't listen to you but if you say can you please explain mm -hmm. to me how that's funny 
is actually looking, in, they're looking internally and it's more likely in my experience to create a long lasting change. Mm. If they're thinking like, oh, actually, like they go to explain it and a lot of time they'll be like, and they'll be like, that's really bad. <laughs> um, so that's kind of one of the things that I like to do. That's actually a really good point because it puts the, like, the thought process like, mm. is that actually appropriate for me to be doing that right now? Mm -hmm. um, for the ladies online, um, you know, what's your take on setting those boundaries? Do you guys have any processes, protocols, um, things that you guys do? Uh, Bree, you go first. Throw you under the bus. Um, I disagree with what everyone else has said, but I, I would say to people listening, if it feels inappropriate or you feel uncomfortable, then there's a reason. You know, don't let anyone, you know, gaslight you into thinking that, oh, you can't take a joke or, you know, oh, you're taking things too seriously. Um, it is serious. And if it's making you feel that way, then trust your gut and get support and get help. Lauren? Um, absolutely. I think um, the only way for women to feel safe and men to feel safe in their workplaces is if we speak up. And so um, there's a saying that you all might be familiar with, which is speak even if your voice shakes. It has a very, very powerful meaning behind that. So if you're not comfortable, say something. It doesn't have to be in a mean way. It doesn't have to be confrontational. Some of the times behaviours that are, that we see on site from, from these men are just what they're used to or what the norm is to them. But by calling it out in a way that says, really is that really what you think of me or would you say that to your daughter um those are the triggers that will um, start to change the behaviors and what we're trying to do is change the behavior in construction especially and in male populated industries so by naming it calling it out they have to stop and go hang on that's something i wouldn't say to my daughters or wouldn't i wouldn't say that to my wife or I didn't think of it that way. So absolutely speak even if your voice shakes, if you're in danger or if you feel like it's escalated to a point, there's always help out there. And if you remove yourself from that situation, um, especially for the, the smaller subcontractors, it's a little bit harder. There is no HR. Um, so that's when you can rely on different places, you know, 1-800-RESPECT, all of those different um, bodies will help you as well. It just depends on the level of severity. Thank you for that. Um, Georgina, I want to shoot you this question because mm -hmm. I think this is something that's on everyone's mind um, from an employee's perspective. If you get your period on site, do you guys have a process for your site team? What's the process? Do you guys have portal X, Y, Z? What's your take on that stance? And I might even get everyone else's take on their opinion on it as well. But from an employee's perspective, how do you navigate that? Yeah, again, again, depending on who your manager is, you're probably, you might get a varying different kind of degrees of response when it comes to that. You don't necessarily need to tell a manager why you're having to step off site or why you're unwell. You don't have to give any kind of in-depth reason because it's kind of a private medical matter, essentially. So um, you're, you're able to, to communicate to them that you need some time to, to either go off to chemist warehouse or get what you need. Um, and they should be supported of that, especially if you explained it in, in that kind of generic way. Um, on site, we, we at Downer, we're definitely trying to make sure that everybody does feel included. So even on like our remote sites in the roads business where people are working in, you know, areas um, maintaining and, and resurfacing roads, um, now there is that bigger thought process about, right, what facilities do we need to have here? And what do we need to make sure that everybody's comfortable as well? So if those things aren't there, um, similar to what, you know, the previous panelists were saying around using your voice, if those things aren't there in your workplace, whether that is um, appropriate facilities or access to sanitary products, it's really important to voice that to someone you're comfortable to voice it to. So it doesn't necessarily have to be your manager. It could be somebody who is in the office who's female, so they'll relate, um, or it could be a mentor at ASA that you um, can go talk to and get some advice about how to raise that concern or raise that issue. Um, but it's something natural, something that shouldn't be have any sort of shame or stigma attached to it, and it happens to us. So I think it's I think it's really wise to um, feel yeah uh, say how, how yeah, oh god what am I trying to say um, raise it 
however comfortable you feel it's a very individual thing um but like like we've said there's always going to be support there um so at down you know there's a the manager there's an asa mentor there's myself there's hr there's loads of different avenues where you can raise this as a concern and make sure that you get the appropriate facilities in place to feel comfortable Perfect. Louise, did you have a take on this? I feel like Always I got your eyes burning. I mean, <laughs> off me. Um, so practicality on site, let's just get straight to the point. So personally, when I went out and did field service, I would be a pad and a tampon just so then I wouldn't have to like really clean up through the day. Um, I now currently use a cup, which I do recommend to anyone who goes out on site. You don't have any rubbish to throw away. Um, but then also on that, um, the cycle is not only just the bleeding part. Um, you've got your mood swings, your energy levels, and it's really important to be safe while you're out on site, while you go, your body is going through this. Um, it's something that I ignored for a very long time. And actually, um, I'm pretty sure I, I broke my nose because I was exhausted one time and couldn't be bothered to get out from under a truck. And I'm pretty sure looking back, that was at the time of my cycle where I was exhausted. Um, Really making sure that you know you might be putting things in place like not doing overtime the week of or the week before your period, um, having hydrolyte in your drinks the week of or before, um, and then also another thing um, it's for businesses and for individuals is there's a company that I'm partnered with called J9, and they do period toolkit subscriptions. So every month you can get pads, tampons, like the herbal teas that help support your system, heat packs that you can put underneath your work clothes. Um, you can get them delivered every month and employers can purchase that for the women in their business or the girls can um, get that individually and it just really, when you're on the tools and you're out and about a lot, like kind of, sometimes you can end up being in the middle of nowhere and then just quickly go and, okay, let's be honest, when you're out working on farms, sometimes you just go behind a bush. Um, Shaywees. Yep, she always, but I never, I just was like a squatter anyway. <laughs> but so let's just openly talk about that. Sometimes, Absolutely. sometimes that is the situation. Um, and you're like, oh shit, I got my period. Having something like a subscription there that you can just like have it, chuck it in your work yet. It takes that one, it gives you one less thing to think about um, if you've got something like that regularly supplied. What was that organisation again? Uh, J9. Nice. And I also know about Share the Dignity as well. They're mm -hmm. doing a lot of stuff in that space, making sure that everyone has access to it for free. And not. Did you have any take on it? Or can I move to this very question? I don't have anything. I, I think that was really complicated. That was just, did anyone else? Because that was like, schmick. And she said the first swear word, everyone, it wasn't me. So. Oh, did I swear? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Anastasia has asked, and I want to answer this first and then everyone can go. I know we all can individually conquer the world. Yes, we can. Can you just explain why is it so important to tap into this network of empowered women in the field? So for me, personally, I could have been a tradie. I should have been a tradie. And I didn't know I could have been one. So being able to tap into other women, you're, you're, you yourself, you're probably empowered yourself but you can be that mentor or that you know shining light for someone to aim towards and you can help somebody else burn as bright as you. It's not just about, you know, I'm doing amazing and I'm doing well, that's phenomenal. You can also, you know, share that fire with somebody else. That's why we're banding together to increase those 13%, the 3% in the industries. That's why we're trying to grow to make sure that these period conversations aren't awkward because let's be honest, all of us here, we're all comfortable, but the men online are just going, Ugh. I know it's uncomfortable for them. I'm going to talk about it more because it makes you uncomfortable. And that's just the kind of person I am. But why Why do we need to do this? Why do you think we need do to do this? I? Yeah, go. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important to be able to talk about what your concerns are, what your fears are, what your experiences are. Because I know from myself, um, in my own life, I'll sit and I'll think, oh my goodness, there's something wrong with me because this is happening to me, but I can't see it happening to anybody else. And yet when I share with the um, other women in my life, they go, oh, absolutely, I've totally had experience with that. It sucks, or this is what I did, or, and it's even just having that, being able to speak, and then having that friendly ear just go, you know what, you're not alone. Um, and that makes it so much easier to carry whatever burden it is. And it's also good problem solving. What did you do? Yeah. Um, I'll go to the ladies on mine soon, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> simple one, like, having a community that can mm. cheer you on when you're doing well and support you in the really hard times is so important and has really gotten me mm. to the point where I am today. Yeah. Bray, what about you? 
I think just seeing the connection through our Women in Renewables program, um, there's so many amazing women working in the space um, all over Australia and having that network and connection um, is really important and I've seen that firsthand. Love it. Thank you. And I've just been told that we have one minute left, so I'm cutting loose and I love all these questions. So what I'm going to do is if you do have these questions and I haven't been able to get to them, please email them through to info at skillsroad.com.au. We would love to, um, you know, connect with you and talk you through some of these questions that we haven't been able to get to. And again, all these wonderful ladies contact details will be sent to you via email if you have registered. OK, so making sure that we have registered on the link. Now, let's get to the winners. Um, am I? Yep. So Sam definitely won. That was hilarious, and I love it. And just like speaking to my soul. Um, Anastasia, that one about why you've just been able to light all the fires and you know show that passion of why. So I love that question. And um, I'm digging Betty because the question that I want to end on, and I'd love for her to email me directly. How can an employer better support psychological needs out in the field in a day out? All right. So I want Betty to win that as well. Please email me your details so then we can connect you with resources and how to best support, as well as I can connect you with Nalwick as well, because they've got some wonderful psychological um, assistance there to help support you and link you in that place. Um, yep, countdown is on and I have reached my limit. So we've got Betty, Anastasia and Sam. Please send through your details so we can get those $50 Bunnings gift vouchers over to you guys. Thank you guys so much for today. And I feel absolutely powerful. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, let's go and tackle this Wednesday and can't wait to connect with you guys again. Thank you again, everyone, for being online, our team online. Thank you for spending the hour with us and my, my lovely friends here. Um, and I can't wait to do this again. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.